Hey guys, Dr. Who here with 1HP and today I'm going to help you guys understand why AIM training works with a little bit of neuroscience. And as a background, I am a doctor of physical therapy, orthopedic clinical specialist, certified strength and conditioning specialist, and I've also been working in esports in the past four years as a performance specialist. My colleague, Caitlin McGee, is the neuroscience expert within the team at 1HP and I did lean on her a lot to confirm a lot of what I found in the research about aim training. I also want to credit Elliot or 1HP Medic, our esports medicine intern here at 1HP, who's also a physical therapist, who helped so much in actually contributing to writing the article that we'll be posting in the description. So today you guys are going to learn the key concepts of aim training and the physiologic adaptations that occur if you guys are consistently performing some aim training protocols. Let's go. So before we get into a deep discussion about the science and physiology behind aim training, we need to define esports or gaming aim. And to be more specific, we're trying to define virtual aim. So as you guys can see here, virtual aim is our ability to control a medium to direct a mouse reticle or cursor at a target. In other words, it's how well we are able to control our peripheral, the mouse. And virtual aim has subcomponents we need to clarify as well. For the purpose of this video, we're going to be discussing aim primarily for PC gamers, as the majority of discussions around aim have been around controlling the mouse. So here's our current, our version one definition of some of these subcomponents. One, tracking. The ability to follow a visual stimulus target with your mouse reticle. Two, click timing. The ability to time an appropriate click on a target with a moving or non-moving mouse reticle. So we can actually split these into both dynamic and static subcategories. So there will be dynamic tracking, static tracking, dynamic click timing, and static click timing. So we're going to go through each of these to help you guys understand all of these subcategories of AIM or virtual AIM. And we're going to be utilizing Fortnite to illustrate or show you guys an example of each one. We're going to start with dynamic tracking, and this is when your reticle moves, but the player is either fixed or is moving. An example of this is AR or SMG tracking. Static tracking is when the reticle is fixed and the player is moving. An example of this is when you're strafing while hip firing an AR or pistol and an opponent that's strafing at the same speed. Dynamic click timing is when the reticle moves and the player is fixed. An example of this is a shotgun flick. Static click timing is when the reticle is fixed and the player moves or is also fixed. An example of this is sniping peaking targets or leading snipes. So it's important for us to identify these subcomponents because this allows coaches or anyone working on the mechanical skill of a player to provide more accurate training scenarios for the athletes, targeting indivisible sub-skills of aim. And the goal for us is to always break down concepts in terms of first principles, basically an assumption which cannot be broken down further. And that allows us to provide coaching or support staff working with players to make the best decisions around AIM. Or if you're working on your AIM alone, you can design a program for yourself. The next thing we want to help you identify is that AIM is a skill. It is a neuromotor skill. And a skill is defined as the ability to consistently perform coordinated movement sequences for the purposes of attaining an action goal. And for us, that means aiming at a head and getting that sweet kill. And as you guys know, skills are learned and perfected as a result of practice, but also experience. But there's also different types of skills. And for gaming purposes, we need to know of three major types, discrete, serial, and continuous. The amazing thing about aim as a skill is that it's all three combined. A discrete skill is one that has a recognizable beginning and end. You aim, you hit a head, they die, it's over. You can also think of it as a single target in Tile Frenzy. A serial skill are a series of discrete actions put together. Think multiple targets within Tile Frenzy or even ascended tracking scenarios. And then a continuous skill has no recognizable 
beginning and end. So within the context of competitive Fortnite, Overwatch, or CSGO, AIM might be using shotgun flicks or long range tracking to sniper shots to SMG tracking all within one game. So you guys can see that AIM is every single one of those. It's all three combined. Alright, finally, let's get down to the discussion of the actual physiology and neuroscience behind aim training. And to help paint an overall picture of the neuroscience, we're going to start with the physiologic systems and structures involved in aim. And we're going to start with the top, the brain. Certain regions and connections in our brain control how we move and consequently how we aim. And there's three major structures we need to know about, but only two of them are really relevant for us and what we need to know about AIM. And those are the cerebellum and the motor cortex, with the third one being the basal ganglia. And these structures control both gross and fine motor movements, the larger and small coordinated movements, which we utilize as we're aiming both with our shoulder, our wrist, and our finger movements. Our movement starts with activity in these regions of the brain, traveling down a specific pathway in which we call the cortical spinal tract, first to our brain stem, then to our spine, and then finally down to the specific muscles of our shoulder, forearm, and hand. These are structures that control our movement and how we aim. And it's important that we define these first as certain adaptations occur when we perform either physical or virtual modes of training for our aim. And I do want to say as a caveat, there are absolutely more structures involved in sensory motor adaptations again, such as the basal ganglia, um, our understanding of the brain continues to evolve over time with research, and I'm sure there will be more structures that we'll be able to identify that influence how we move. But for now, we're only focused on the cerebellum and motor cortex. Okay, there are two major modalities or ways we can approach improving our aim and control associated with aim. The primary mode of training is virtual training, or VT, and that involves utilizing an application to train specific sub-skills of AIM, tracking and click timing described before. And it is the primary mode because it directly trains our ability to aim through scenarios and exercises mimicking in-game environments. Virtual training can be separated further into two approaches considering context. Peripheral control virtual training and esports specific virtual training. Peripheral Control VT involves what has been pioneered by Aimer7 and Kataz with regards to utilizing a third-party application, Kovacs, AimLab, Aiming.pro, to train specific sub-skills of AIM, tracking and click timing described above or before. AimLab and others beginning to appear on the market provide AI-based guidance for self-directed training. Peripheral Control VT utilizes scenarios virtual exercises within the third-party application to improve mouse control, click timing, tracking, and target switching. Some of these examples are one wall six targets, six tile jumbo frenzy, close long strafes invincible, pat target switching, all the scenarios you can find in Kovacs uh, or AimLab or Aiming.pro. Esports specific VT considers the physics and in-game mechanics of the game and involves custom maps within your game of choice to train the specific sub-skills of AIM. Because each game title is different and support for custom maps may not always be present, this approach of training is not always available. A key point to recognize with this method is that it may not always be as efficient in use of your time. For any motor control based training, the goal is to maximize repetitions per minute. With the constraints of certain custom map systems across different game titles, we're often limited in how many repetitions we can achieve per minute. And some examples are in Fortnite, creative map aim trainers that involve click timing and tracking, CSGO, aim bots, Overwatch, tile frenzy, Overwatch scenarios or other maps that have been made to help with aim, Widowmaker death matches. Those are all examples of in-game or esports specific virtual training. 
The secondary mode is physical training, which focuses on improving efficiency and effectiveness of the pathway that we described above, the brain to spinal cord to muscle pathway. And this involves specific exercises which address speed, endurance, gross motor coordination and motor control, and proprioception. It is physical because it targets these physical skills without the context of gaming or use of a peripheral. Physical training is meant to support the adaptations achieved with virtual training, but also ensure we're not hindered in our progress by developing injuries. And some examples are proprioceptive shoulder and wrist exercises, tossing exercises, composite finger extension, wrist extension with a dumbbell, bilateral theraband, external rotation, and many more. All right, now that we've established the physiologic structures and modes of training our aim, we can get to what is actually changing when we perform virtual or physical training. So what happens when we consistently perform virtual aim training? The major system of our bodies which respond to virtual training is the nervous system. The majority of positive changes and improvements that we see with our aim involves neural adaptations in the pathway listed above, the brain to muscle pathway. Improvements in our aim is rooted in the theory of neuroplasticity, the inherent ability of our brains and our nervous system to adapt. When we consistently perform aim training scenarios and exercises, here are some of what we believe happens. Okay, number one, we process information in our brains more efficiently. And this is based on the theory of cortical efficiency, in which certain regions of the brain will have a decreased level or extent of activation over time when performing and learning a motor skill. When we develop, adapt, and become more familiar to any basic level of skill, there is less conscious effort and thus overall less activity and use of the metabolic resources of the brain. And in the case of aim training, we become more familiar with the basic ability to control our mouse with tracking and click timing movements represented by higher accuracy or scores in Kovac scenarios or aim lab scenarios or benchmarks that we participate in. And while there is more to cortical efficiency than the reduction of activity, it's been shown that there's a slight shift in the representational areas depending on the stage of learning. It's enough for us to understand how our brain makes adaptations to allow us to improve aim. And as a last note, there has been some evidence to show that there is also an increase in gray matter, the part of our brains containing the bodies of the nerves, connections, and other protective cells that's also task dependent. Harder tasks like aim training may require more nervous system demands, require an increase in volume of the gray matter, whereas more simple motor tasks like lifting your arm up will only be so demanding. Okay, number two, signals travel more quickly in the aiming pathway. The signals in our brain travel down more quickly to our muscles and is based on the theory of long-term potentiation, or LTP. LTP is the increase of strength at the connections of the nerves, or synapses, if there are consistent signals sent through the pathways, whether it be changes in how many microsignals, neurotransmitters, are sent at the connection or how sensitive the second nerve is to these microsignals, the result is improved communication between the nerve cells as a pathway is used. So the more that we train our motor pathways with aim training, the more effective they become. Effective meaning faster signaling and traveling of information from the brain to the muscles. And what is interesting to realize too is that the regions of the brain that are likely involved in how we utilize the pathways, click timing versus tracking, use the same motor pathway but have different outputs. We use the same nerves and muscles to track and time our clicks but depending on the region and context identified in the brain, there is a different output. So the bottom line here is that we move more easily as we continue to train our aim because of these improved structural changes. Number three, more efficient use of our muscle fibers. The other major adaptation I want to cover in this video involves the concept of selective recruitment or how well we use our muscles as we learn a motor skill. Based on the type of movement we are performing, we only need a certain amount of muscle fibers. These are controlled by certain nerves we call motor units and involves a certain understanding of the slow and fast twitch fibers in our muscles. We have a genetic 
predisposition for a certain amount of fibers of each type, fast, slow, or there's a transitionary type. And based on the activity we are performing, we are likely to only use some and not all of the fibers. You can think of your slow fibers as endurance fibers, while fast fibers are the explosive, quick movement fibers. And of course, this is a simplification for better understanding. When we perform a fast flick, we likely only need to use our fast twitch fibers. However, if we are unfamiliar with a movement, we will potentially recruit some small fibers, creating inefficiency of movement. When we train our aim over time, we are better at identifying which fibers we need in the respective type of movement, tracking or click timing, and thus become more accurate in our aim. Hope your brains are still doing well after seeing or learning all this information. But now we're going to get to physical training protocols and physical training primarily involves the muscular system. However, there are definitely some of the nervous system adaptations that we described before. We care about the muscular system adaptations because they are our capacity to perform the movements within aim. As mentioned above, physical training involves performing exercises which help us improve our speed, endurance, gross and fine motor coordination, proprioception. I don't plan on going into too much depth in this section as it basically is taking a course on adaptations to resistance training or aerobic training. Instead, I want to go over some of the key changes that are relevant to our tissue's capacity when aim training. One, we have improved local muscular endurance. And I've preached this over and over with my concept of the health bar that we need to develop our tissue's capacity to handle repeated load to make sure we can play, and in this case, aim train without worrying about tissue damage. When we perform physical training protocols and resistance training exercises designed to build up our muscular endurance, which is represented in cellular changes at our muscles. When we perform physical training protocols and resistance exercises designed to build up our muscular endurance, there are cellular changes that occur within our muscles. One, we have an improved ability to handle chemical and physical stress over time, oxidative and buffering capacity. Our fibers adapt to the type of movement we're performing on a regular basis, so fiber transitions. The power plant of our cells, or mitochondria, and the blood capillaries surrounding our muscles increase, and quite a few other changes. The end result is that we can play COVAX or AIM Lab or whatever training medium for more than 30 minutes without experiencing soreness or our ability to recover from a session of high volume physical and chemical stress improves, mainly due to enzymes around recovery and metabolite removal. Two, we have a better understanding of where our shoulder, elbow, wrist, and fingers are in space. This is that theory of proprioception, which involves nerves at various locations within our muscles, tendons, ligaments, joints, that send signals to our brain to identify where our overall body is in physical space. A prime example of proprioception is the ankle sprain. When we sprain our ankle, our proprioception is negatively affected and in turn, if we don't properly rehabilitate our ankle, we're often at a higher risk for re-injury or re-sprains because of our foot. We might think that it is in a neutral position, but it is in fact in an inverted position when we're about to step or land and that causes a re-injury. So for physical training, if we continue to work on developing our brains, spatial representation of our upper extremity, the right arm for training, then we can improve our overall control of our hand and consequently our overall control of our peripheral. All right, that's it for part one of this AIM training series. In part two, we're gonna be discussing how you can optimize your training. So stay tuned for that one. Elliot's probably gonna be taking the lead for a lot of the bits and pieces and education in that section. So stay tuned. Thanks again for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe. Hope you guys learned a lot. Share this with anyone you feel like it was helpful for. And see you guys soon.